Welcome back to the Double Leg. I am one half of your host, Hey Jive Picks, other half of the host, the Parlay. Joining me in, we're going to be talking some UFC Vegas 65, I believe it is. Yep. Uh, but before we do that, we had uh, we missed the week before because I was on vacation, so we couldn't really film. But we could talk about that one, and we didn't really get to recap the UFC 281. So betting wise, or however you want to talk about it, UFC 281. What do you think of it? UFC 281 was not a great betting night for me, but dude, overall the fights on there was amazing. The main event, Izzy and Perea, dude, I'm talking. Fireworks, you know, I didn't know how this fight was going to go. I thought that Izzy would be a little bit more timid. He's been knocked out before by him. Um, but, you know, we had some pretty good action the whole entire fight. Izzy caught him at the end of that first round, wobbled Perea. You know, he had a hard time walking back to his corner. And then um, as the fight went on, I thought Alex was going to gas a little bit, going to be a little bit more tired. He's never been that full five rounds in MMA before. But he came out and put it on him in that final round, got the knockout, I'm sure you cashed that ticket. You took Alex Perea. I was on Izzy, um, but I was just glad to see a, a good fight and one that people are still talking about. It was that good. Yeah, I thought that was probably one of the best pay-per-views of the year. I think that's got to be my vote for the best pay-per-view of the year. Um, that main card was – I mean, the whole card in general was just straight violence, uh, but that main card in general, Poirier – and Chandler, that was a firefight. And then uh, Zhang Wei Li went out there and just smoked Carlos Barza. And then we had a finally had a good main event with Izzy. And yep. uh, that was, I was happy about that. For me, betting wise, I went, I had a pretty good night. Uh, really, the only bad read, read I had was uh, Silvana Gomez Juarez. And I didn't get to watch that fight, but from what I, heard from you that like there's something sketchy with uh, the scorecards so who knows um yeah but i from what i saw uh on like replays and everything it looked like she was probably gonna lose but yeah overall, I mean, good, yeah great card though i mean ryan span i was i wasn't high on ryan span because he looked like shit in the weigh-ins i didn't think he was gonna go in there and be able really? to take reyes shots um but dominic reyes man he's on you know, four fights skid now. Ryan Span looked good while it lasted, got the knockout. And then Molly Meatball. I threw a little bit of money on her just because she was such a big underdog and she's so strong and powerful. I was hoping for the KO. But Erin Blanchfield, man, she looks like the real deal of that division. She, I mean, she ran right through Molly McCann. Got her caught in that crucifix, raining down elbows, finally found the submission. Um, so I think a lot of people are going to be even higher on her as we go on. Mm -hmm. But how about Dan Hooker getting a win finally? I was super pumped to see that. Beat Claudio Puelas. Um, It kind of went exactly how I thought. You know Claudio is going to be fishing for submissions, knee bars. That's kind of the name of his game. That's what he sticks to. And on the feet, Dan Hooker, you know, he's as solid as they come, even though he hasn't had a lot of wins lately. And he got the knockout. Um, so happy to see that. I like Dan Hooker. I'm glad he's back in the win column. Yeah, a lot of people counting out Dan Hooker, myself included. And uh, Quadio Poyas almost had that knee bar, and I was, yeah. I was getting a little, little excited there. But after that, he was just done. You could tell yeah. the moment kind of got to him. I think, uh, you know, to fighters talk about conserving your energy, your energy, and how the mental battle can like wear on your gas tank as well. I think that definitely happened in that one for sure. He only made it like two rounds, or he, I don't think it made it to the third round, mm -hmm. uh, but he looked gassed and he looked like a fish out of water. In he there. did. Yeah. Um, for UFC Vegas 64, or the one with um, Derek Lewis and Sergey Spivak, the, the, home, or the main event got canceled. So the, the real main event after that was Nzechiku and Kutalaba. And Nzechiku got the win there. I didn't have yeah. a lot of action on this card because uh, I wasn't really able to place much. Uh, but how'd it go for you? Yeah, I, I, I kept it small in this card because there was so many fights that um, the odds were super close. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable taking any of the fighters on the card, to be honest with you. Either, you know, these fights could have gone either way. I know I took Chase Sherman, who got the loss, and the only reason I took him is because he's fighting a guy who fought two weeks ago who got his legs beat up. So that was more of a value play. Um, I didn't necessarily think Chase Sherman was the better fighter or was going to get the win. But, you know, at plus 200 or whatever he was, I had to take a chance. Um, Andre Fialo, I, I took him by knockout. 
but he's kind of proved that he's only got about a round, a round and a half in him. And after that, he kind of breaks. Yeah. Um, Muslim Solikov looked pretty damn good, especially late in the fight. I think the most impressive fighter on this card was Jack Della Maddalena. And, you know, fought Danny Roberts, who's not the, you know, most top tier fighter. But Jack looked good, uh, barely got touched, and then got the knockout in the first round. He's going to be a guy going forward that I'm going to be super high on. Other than that, man, it was just, you know, the Derek Lewis and Sergey fight gets canceled. That's a huge bummer because who doesn't want to watch Derek Lewis get in there and throw hands? And then Cody Brundage and Hadolfo Vieira got canceled as well. And those are, that would have been a kind of a grinded out good fight, in my opinion. So overall, this card kind of fell off last minute. Um, but hell, I mean, it was fights nonetheless. We didn't get anything this weekend. So, but we're going to go right into UFC Orlando with a damn good card. And I can't wait for that one. Yep, no fights this past weekend, and then kind of a, a doozy of a card the weekend before that. But we got three straight weeks of fire cards, UFC Orlando, yeah. UFC 282, and then uh, a fight night at the Apex that is loaded as well. I don't know if you've looked at that one, but it is it is stacked to the gills. And then we got a month off, so we're going to make these three count. And uh, let's get right into UFC Orlando, starting with the main event. Steven Thompson and Kevin Holland. This one's sitting near a pick em. I think uh, these odds are a little outdated, but Kevin Holland's moving a little bit more towards a favorite now. Yeah. Um, Steven Thompson pushing 40 years old. Kevin Holland coming off of the the loss to Hamza Chemaev. Um, this will be his third official fight at welterweight. Who are you thinking on this one? You know, I've kind of gone back and forth because I like the technicalities and Steven Thompson's uh, stand-up game a ton but like you said man he's getting close to 40 years old and it's tough to pick fighters that are getting up there in age especially when you're fighting a guy like Kevin Holland who you know is going to take a punch to give one he's going to hit you hard as well he kind of throws everything with all he's got and he's long man I know Steven's got good movement um, like I said that striking is super good but you know at, at what point does he lose a step at what point does he you know he's not as quick as he used to be and if you get caught by Holland, Holland's shown that he hits really hard and he can put the lights out. So right now, while the line is closer to even, I'm going to take Kevin Holland. I like the youth. Um, I like the activity. I mean, Kevin Holland has been active for the last three, four years. I mean, fighting as much as possible. And Stephen Wonderboy Thompson just hasn't been as active in the last couple of years. So I think Holland's going to have the advantage here. He just can't get caught by some of those angles that Stephen Thompson likes to cut. And uh, I don't know. He's got to stay within himself and not get too wild either. He's got to keep it tight. Yeah, that's a bit of an, a big ask to, yeah. uh, to tell Kevin Holland to, to keep it tight. But yep. uh, I'm on the same boat here. You can't really be back in Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Can't really call him Wonderboy either. Yes. He's, uh, he's a, the Wonder Man, the age old <laughs> wonder, whatever you want to say. But at 40 years old, can't really back him. He's going to be undersized compared to, to Kevin Holland in this one. Most people will be. Kevin Holland, 6'3", 81-inch reach. Steven Thompson, 6'75", inch reach. So he's going to be the smaller man. And uh, as a, a karate-style fighter and a striker, that's not going not gonna to do well for you if you're undersized. Uh, Kevin Holland, I think he could maybe even mix in some grappling here. Yeah. Um, just based off of Thompson's last two losses to Gilbert Burns and Blah Muhammad, that's kind of a recipe to beat him. Um, but he's just going to bring the action. And at these odds, I think that's a steal of a price. Uh, I got Kevin Holland at straight up even money uh, probably like a month ago. Uh, and then I put a little bit more in at, at minus 120. I think he's like minus 140 now, somewhere around there. Uh, yeah, I see it minus 140 right now. So even at that price, like I feel like that's pretty solid. Yeah. Uh, but who knows? I mean, Stephen Thompson could turn back the clock uh, in the bigger cage. I just don't see it happening. So I think Kevin Holland is a great play. Um, and I would feel really confident taking him. And I have, I think I have what, four units in total on him. So. That says, that'll say something to you. Yeah, and here's the thing with Kevin Holland for me. When he's not fighting a guy who's grappling heavy or can wrestle his ass off, Kevin Holland is a super good fighter. 
I mean, look at his losses. It's Hamzat Chemaev, which I think everybody and their dog knew that he was probably going to lose that fight on the ground. Marvin mm. Vittori, Derek Brunson, guys who can grapple and wrestle. So, I mean, if he gets in there with a guy who is strictly striking like Wonderboy is, I think he's going to have a lot of success. And uh, we've even, even seen him win late, lately over Tim Means by Darce Choke. He is a black belt under Travis Luter on the ground. I know a lot of people don't think he deserves to be a black belt, but he is a black belt, and he's super long. He's got those long limbs. And if he you know, can knock Stephen Wonderboy Thompson down or even get a takedown, he's long enough. He can, he can cinch in some choke, I believe, and get him by submission on the ground for sure. And it's plus 600 for him to win by submission right now. I'm definitely going to sprinkle some on that, but on the money line too, I think there's a ton of value there as well right now. Yeah, the big knock on him when he was at middleweight is that he's just undersized, he's too skinny, and he's getting manhandled by these wrestlers. You know, yeah. Derek Brunson, Marvin Vittori, and then Hamza Chimaev. But, you know, that experience, and then he's going to be the bigger man uh, in most of his fights at welterweight. I think he's not going to have any problems uh, mixing, in, mixing in wrestling at, yeah. at welterweight. So, I especially agree. in this fight. So, uh, I don't think any of the props are out. But I don't know. I would maybe look to see Kevin Holland by submission, see what that number is. If it's juicy enough, I'll definitely be sprinkling in on that. Anything else on this one? Yeah, no, just that I, there's a few books, books that have it right now, and submission for Kevin Holland is at plus 600. It's not bad. No, it's not bad. at all. Not bad. Do you know uh, by knockout? In by that? knockout's plus 175 for yeah. Holland and plus 250 for Wonderboy. I just don't see Wonderboy having the – the snap on his punches to put Holland out. Um, and like I said, man, Holland at 170, he's going to be a long, a big guy. It's going to be harder for Stephen Wonderboy Thompson to find the target as much as he is used to. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think all signs point to Kevin Holland. I can't believe it's this close in the odds. I was surprised when, when I saw it come out too. So, yep, both of us are on Kevin Holland. We'll move on to the co-main event. This is a, a great fight as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Really excited for this one. Uh, the, the odds don't tell the same story, though. Uh, Dos Anjos, heavy favorite in this one over Brian Barbarina, but Barbarina's always game for a good fight. Seems like he'll fight up, up to his competition and down to his competition. So hopefully he can uh, fight up to his competition in this one. Dos Anjos coming off the loss to Fiziv. He's going to be moving up from uh, lightweight, 155. This fight is at welterweight which is uh, Barbarina's normal weight. He's coming off the win to Robbie Lawler uh, three months ago, standing knockout with the flurry. Um, for me, I don't know that I could get behind a, a Dos Anjos ticket at, at minus 300 plus, uh, but I do think he wins the fight. It's just the dog that Brian Barbarina is, and like I said, he just fights up to his competition. I, I wouldn't feel good about laying that heavy a chalk, uh, yeah. even that it, even that it is Rafael Dos Anjos, the legend himself. But maybe some value on Brian Barberina uh, in this one. So that's really my takeaway on it. I think Dos Anjos wins, but I'm not going to be betting on him. Yeah, no, and my whole thing with Brian Barberina is, you know, when are we going to see him fight a guy? who's in his prime. I mean, Brian Barberina's last two fights, Robbie Lawler, Matt Brown. He got the standing TKO against Robbie Lawler. But, I mean, everybody knows Lawler's past his prime by a couple of years. Uh, but, I mean, Brian Barberina's so tough. I just don't know if, if Dos Anjos is going to stay in front of him and just have a boxing match. I think Do Dos Anjos is going to work in the wrestling. Um, he's going to try to get it to the ground and just grind it out. But, you know, Brian Barberina is a bigger guy here. He's definitely going to be the bigger guy. He's not a small, small 170 -er. And, you know, if Dos Anjos is moving up to fight him at 170, um, I don't know. I, I don't think there's any value on the money line for Dos Anjos. I don't necessarily think he's going to go and submit Brian Barberina either. If you are on the Dos Anjos side here, I think it's got to be by decision. I just don't see a world where he knocks him out or gets a sub, in my opinion. Because at, at some point, Dos Anjos is going to start his decline if he hasn't already. I mean, he is an older fighter for that division. Um, I don't think he's got, you know, a whole bunch left in him as far as go out there in a five-round war, knocking people out, submitting people. At some point, I think we're going to start to see a slight decline in RDA if we haven't already. Yeah, 38 years old, but 
you look at his his fights, man. The, the, yeah, it's a lot of miles on him uh, with who he's been in the cage with: Kamaru Usman, Kobe Covington, Leon Edwards, Panatha Moicano, Rafael Fazeev in his last one. Uh, you saw him get finished there in the in the fifth round. This one a three round fight. I do think Dos Anjos by decision is not a bad bet. Do you know the, yeah. the price for that one? Right now, by decision, doesn't look like it's out quite yet. Okay. Um, just the main event was out. I imagine him by decision is going to be if he's a minus five forty. Um, you know, RDA. T- I mean, he does have submissions and a little bit of power. I'm going to say by decision is going to be anywhere from plus one twenty to plus one fifty. I'm going to say right in that area would be my guess. Yeah. I think if he does win, that's how it gets it done. I think. I think Vegas is probably thinking similar too. Yeah, Brian Barberina has some absolutely terrible takedown defense. So yep. Dos Anjos will definitely mix in the grappling in that one. Uh, could get, you know, some ground time of, you know, two or three minutes in a round. So stall out the time there. So not a bad look in that one. Uh, anything else on this one before we move on? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think it will be all RDA in this fight. Brian Barberina just, I don't know. I don't think he's a you know, top, top tier fighter. I don't think he's going to be able to go out there and just, you know, stand and bang with RDA and knock him out by any means. I just think mm-hmm. RDA is going to be too much, especially in the wrestling department. It's just going to be a matter of how he gets it done. Absolutely. We're going to a banger in the flyweight division, Mateusz Nikolau and Matt Schnell. Nikolau, five straight wins for him. Um, yeah. And then Matt Schnell coming off, in my opinion, the fight of the year with uh, Sumaderchi at UFC Long Island. That was just insane. I watched it the other day again. And the shots that he took, I mean, he that fight could have been stopped so easily. But for him to rally back and uh, get that win over Sumaderchi, who's a very solid opponent, very impressive, uh, but definitely something to, to keep in mind of, yeah. of when we're uh, breaking this one down. But... Uh, Nicolau, it said minus 225 as a favorite on topology there, but I think he's moved to like minus one or minus 360 right now. Yeah. Minus 365. Yeah. It's, it's moving in his favor. Uh, he's obviously, uh, he's got a better record, 18 and two. I think he, this is a little bit rich considering, uh, the violence that like Matt Schnell can, can put on you. Um, but I do think Nikolau wins. Matt Schnell is always game for an upset. You just saw it in his last fight. He was minus 225, I think, as, yeah. a, as a dog there. So hard to count him out. Uh, what are you thinking on this? Yeah, it's tough because Schnell just out of nowhere can find wins. I mean, he can be hurt as all can be and then, you know, throw up an arm bar or try to try a guillotine when he's, when, you know, he's trying to get taken down or anything. But Matt Schnell is one of the most game guys, but here's the knock I have on him. He gets hurt a lot in his mm-hmm. fights. I mean, he gets clipped. He gets uh, – in, in that last fight against Suma Derji, I mean, he – like you said, he was near getting finished multiple times and then somehow finds the submission. Um, I don't trust him to get the win here, but what I do like is the under two and a half rounds. I know that uh, Nicolau is not going to go in there. He hasn't finished a whole bunch of people. He gets a lot of decisions. Right. Like I said, man, Schnell gets clipped a lot. If he can clip him, um, Nikolau definitely has a submission ability. And who knows, maybe Matt Schnell will find a submission of his own. He is very, very slick on the ground. I just think someone's getting finished here. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the first round, first one and a half rounds. So the under two and a half rounds plus 100 is what I'm really, really looking at in this fight. It's funny you say that because I have the exact same play. I yep. that that's just the way to go about this one. Uh, but – I will be looking at props when they come out uh, to see Nikolau by KO, see what that price is. Um, because Nikolau's last four fights has gone to decision. So I think you're getting a really good price on the under here, considering mm-hmm. uh, Nikolau is he's a crisp striker on the feet. You look at his last fight with David Dvorak, he knocked him down like twice, yep. him, uh, two or three times. Matt Schnell, when he gets hit, when he gets clipped, he just starts swinging and he gets really aggressive. So I think if Nikolau catches him uh, at any point within the first round, like Matt Schnell is gonna just gonna go in that mode and he's gonna start swinging and it's gonna be chaos and yep. Nikolau can get it done. Um, but 
even if he doesn't get it done, I think Schnell could could get it done too. Um, just if he puts on a barrage or or gets on top of him or or snatches up a neck, something like that. But I think the under two and a half is definitely the play here. Uh, the only other play I would maybe think is Nikolau by KO or Schnell uh, by submission. But yeah, Nikolau by KO too. I I can't, actually can't wait to see what those odds are because if you look, he hasn't had a knockout since 2014. So that's eight mm-hmm. years. But said Nick or uh, Matt Schnell gets clipped man and and uh, it's always what you're least expecting in these types of fights so yeah I'm gonna be surprised or I wouldn't be surprised if you're getting like plus 1,000 plus 900 somewhere in those in that ballpark for him to get a knockout and if it's that high I think it's definitely worth sprinkling some money on that just with Schnell's track record in my opinion yeah absolutely I think uh I think that one's just it's too, too much violence to <laughs> yeah. Not go the distance, or at yeah, least the under- I agree. It's just a, a great play there. Uh, but more violence in the heavyweight division. Ty Tuivasa and Sergey Pavlovich. Tuivasa breaking my heart in the last last uh, fight to Cyril Gan, but showed a lot of heart in that one, mm-hmm. and uh, quite the chin, but it took a lot of damage, and that's that's concerning. Pavlovich uh, starched Derek Lewis in a kind of a controversial stoppage in that one in his last one. Uh, and then four straight wins uh, for him. His only loss is to Alistair Overeem. He got smashed on the ground there. Tuivasa, uh, 29 years old, Pavlich, 30 years old, so very similar in age here. What are you thinking in this one? Man, I, I hate betting against Ty Tuivasa. And you kind of saw in the last fight, he fought Cyril Gaon, who's one of the best most technical heavyweights we've seen in a long time in the UFC. And he was able to hurt him, knocked him down. You know, I don't want to say he was close to a finish, but, you know, he took him off his feet. So a guy like Tai Tuivasa, who's got that power in his hands, um, it's hard to bet against him. I don't think – I think he's going to be a little outmatched here. But, again, I'd like to see Tai Tuivasa by knockout what those odds are and just play it for fun, not put anything significant on it. Yeah. Um, because I, I wouldn't want to take Pavlovich either because – of that power that Tai Tuivasa possesses. So right. I don't know. I, I, this is a fight where I'm definitely taking a prop. It probably would be a Tai Tuivasa KO is what I'm leaning. I wouldn't be highly confident in it because I think Pavlovich, you know, has capabilities to where he can avoid that at all costs, get it to the ground, um, and make this an ugly fight for Tai. But again, man, every fight starts on the feet. Ty's got that big power. He's basically hurt or knocked out everybody he's fought, including guys like Cyril Gaon. So if he can touch Cyril Gaon, I don't see why he can't touch Pavlovich either. But I don't know. It's a tough one. I'm just going to play that prop and have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, we all know the power that Ty Tuivasa possesses. He is surprisingly athletic uh, with – I mean, he whips his leg kicks. He's – I don't want to say he's fast, but you know, for how he looks, he look he's a little fast. Yeah. And what he did to to clip Cyril Gaon, that's like that takes a lot of skill too. Like you can't just get lucky with that. Um, yep. Tai Tuivasa, as a dog, it's very hard to pass up. Um, but the big thing with Ty is if he gets in a, a swinging battle, just a, a bang it out battle with another guy, he always had a good chin. And I'm curious to see how he ba- bounces back from all the damage he took in that gone fight. Just, I mean, he took some on in the gut and in the face and everywhere imaginable. Gone put it on him uh, yeah. as well. So I, I don't know if that chin is going to be the same. Um, Pavlovich is super powerful as well. I hate betting against Russians. <laughs> but I think I got to lean Tai Tuivasa as a as an underdog because, you know, these guys are probably going to stand and bang. Pavlovich does have uh, wrestling in his back pocket. He's, like, never used it in the UFC. Yeah. But it could be an avenue. Ty's not the best uh, on the ground. He's more of a, a try-to-get-up kind of guy and just keep swinging. But I'm just excited to watch this one. I'm excited to see if, if Ty can – get back on the winning train. He's one of my, my favorite fighters in the UFC. It's hard to hate the guy, uh, but I'll take Tai Tuivasa at the plus money. Uh, I think he's like plus 150 right now. 
that line moved. I think it was like plus 115 around that when it opened. So it's moving towards Pavlovich. Uh, but overall, give me Tuivasa. I like it. I, I love it. And I'm going to be there live. So this fight is the one I'm really, really looking forward to. You get the two big boys who are going to slug it out. It's going to be a lot of fun live. But I just noticed something super interesting. Pavlovich, every single fight besides three, I think it's, let's see, 12 fights that he's won uh, round one finish. And then he's won three by decision. So, I mean, he doesn't go past one round that often. So if he goes in there and, and Tui Vasa can survive that first round, I mean, when you're fighting a guy like Ty who's going to come nonstop and hit you over and over and over, I'm interested to see what he looks like in the second, third round at this level. So if, if Ty can survive that first round, I think he can make it interesting. Um, we'll have to see that. Like I said, he has been the distance before, not very often, and definitely not against guys like Ty Tui Vasa. So that's interesting as well. I think I'll be looking at the live odds, I think. I think if – if Serge, or if uh, Pavlovich can go out there and win round one, and then you get some ridiculous live number like Ty Tuivasa plus three hundred, plus four hundred, I'm definitely going to hammer it and just hope the fight goes later and Ty can find some kind of knockout. But yeah. overall, I'm leaning underdog here for sure. Yeah, I think that's that's the move, but could definitely lose that one. But I'm jealous that you're going to be there because that's going <laughs> to be just that's going to be a banger. It will be a good card all so, the way around. Yeah, just. Stop to top to bottom is mm -hmm. great, and uh, move on to a middleweight fight here. That's uh, was going to be great, and I think still is is pretty great. Hermanson was supposed to fight Derek Brunson. Brunson pulls out the injury, in steps Roman Delice, coming off the the KO win to Phil Haas, where he tore his knee up, and then looked at the ref and was like, "I I guess I got to knock him out," and he knocks him out. Uh, Hermanson. Coming off the win to Chris Curtis at UFC Paris. Both 34 years old. Uh, this is a big opportunity for Delite and uh, for her Manson. I guess, I don't know. Not a not a ton to win, but uh still needs a win if he if he wants any shot at uh taking or fighting for a title anytime. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking in this one? This is kind of a tough one. Um, you know, her Manson. He's going to want to grapple. He's going to want to wrestle, in my opinion. You know, we saw against Chris Curtis. He did a really good job of point fighting and got the decision easy in that one. He was good at frustrating guys like Chris Curtis. But I don't think Delize is going to allow it. I think Roman Delize is going to come in there full 100% violence from start to finish. Um, keeps it on the feet, man. Roman Delize finishes guys, and he finishes them quick. Hits like a truck. I think he's got a lot of skill on the feet, and he's got a lot of tools. And then you look at, you know, Jack Hermanson beat Chris Curtis in the right before that loss to Sean Strickland by a split decision. Um, and I just think Roman Delize is going to be a lot more aggressive than guys like Sean Strickland. He's going to hit a little bit harder. He's a little quicker. I just, I don't know. I like Roman Delize here besides the short notice fight. But, I mean, he didn't fight that long ago, so he's going to be in shape, I believe. Yeah. Um, just not a whole lot of time to prepare for Jack Hermanson. But, I don't know. To me, Jack Hermanson's not a guy – that's super unorthodox or anything that you're going to have to have a ton of, a ton of weeks to, to prepare for. So Roman Delize, this is a big opportunity for him. I think he could capitalize here. And if so, the sky's the limit for this guy. I mean, he's always fired up when he's in there. I think he's going to be a fan favorite, especially um, from his part of the world. I don't know. I just got a feeling on this one. I'm going to take the underdog here. Yeah. Just like you said, uh, Hermanson, really just point fighted Chris Curtis stayed out of harm's way. Chris Curtis kind of just like wanted him to stand and box with him. But it's mm -hmm. like, can't really just ask the, the guy to come step in and fight you. But uh, Roman Delize is not going to act that way. He's going to go take the fight to you. So I'm interested to see how it, it pans out. I don't think, I don't know, maybe I'll sprinkle a little bit on Delize at the plus money or maybe see what the props are. Um, maybe you could get something, Juicy on Deliza by KO. Hermanson hasn't uh, been finished that many times, uh, especially in the UFC. His only knockout loss in the UFC is to Jared Cannonier and uh, Tiago Santos. So two, two big boys. Powerful <laughs> boys. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see how it goes. Uh, but as far as a, a good bet, I don't really have one. 
I would probably lean the dog. But Hermanson, he's solid, man. He he showed a lot of improvements on the feet in his last fight. You know, we had, we hadn't really seen that from him. He's more of a, you know, kind of a, a grappler, wants to take you to the ground, uh, that kind of fighting style. And uh, I'm interested to see how he fights this one because the Leeds is a much different opponent than Chris Curtis. So. Right. Yeah, I, I'm going to lean the dog in this one. I might sprinkle something, but as of now, I don't have uh, a good lead on that one. Yeah, it, I mean, it is kind of tough to call because – it almost seems like two completely different fighters, but Hermanson is getting better on the feet. I mean, against Chris Curtis, he looked very technical. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he's never looked sloppy or anything, but it's just never really been his game to stand and strike. Um, he was able to get, get, get it done against Curtis. I just think Delize brings a little bit more to the table than Chris Curtis, um, more explosive. I think it'll be a tougher fight for Jack here. I think Jack's going to have to try to use that, that grappling and wrestling um, but if he doesn't, you know, Delize is powerful enough to make it interesting. So I got to lean the dog here. Yeah. Looking forward to it. But speaking of Roman Delize, uh, the last man to beat Kyle Dawkins, Roman Delize five months ago with that knee in the clinch that sounded like he <laughs> and a bag of air or something, man. That was, that sounded pretty bad, but yeah, Kyle Dawkins, 11 and three. Uh, about a two to one favorite here over Eric Anders, who is coming off two losses. Muniz kind of got to give him a pass on that one. Muniz is, is quite the, the real deal there. And then a split decision loss to Junyun Park. Uh, Anders pushed to 36 years old. Doc is kind of entering his prime here. It's going to be a little bit taller than him. What are you thinking on this one? Yeah, this one's kind of tough too. Um, you know, Anders, that last fight against Park, I thought he won. And maybe I'm biased because I had money on him. But it was super, super close. Could have gone either way. He, he looked like he was slowing down halfway through the fight. And I don't want to say he gassed, but he, he didn't look as good the second half of the fight at all. Didn't have as much power, not as much snap on his shots. And, uh, I mean, Kyle Dawkins is going to bring it to him. Kyle Dawkins, I don't want to say he's been a letdown, but he doesn't have those big wins in the UFC yet. I mean, he's beat Jamie Pickett and Dustin Stoltzfus, who two guys were coming off losses. And, you know, Jamie Pickett's about your most average fighter in the, in the division. I'm sorry, if Jamie Pickett, if you're listening, I'm sure you're not, though. Uh, but I just, I don't know. I don't trust Dawkins enough yet, but I don't trust really Eric Anders either. I don't think he's got, um, you know, all these tools to go out and fight different styles of fights. He's going to be, he's going to have one game plan. It's going to be come forward. Um, He'll box with you a little bit, clinch, fight in the clinch, work in some grappling, and that's about it. But um, it's kind of tough here. Kyle Dawkins at 200, maybe a parlay piece for me. I just don't trust mm -hmm. Anders as much as I do Dawkins. Don't trust either of them, but if I got to lean one way, I'm taking Kyle Dawkins at minus 200, probably throwing him in a parlay. Yeah, I think Dawkins is the much more skilled fighter in this one. Anders is a little bit more of just an athlete that is you know, capable of fighting strong um, and he played football at Alabama, so yep. very athletic. Doc is a little more skilled. He just hasn't really put it all together in a fight. Uh, you know, as you said, his wins over over competition that's not the greatest. Uh, his losses to Phil Hawes, Roman Delize, and uh, Brendan Allen, I believe. So decent opponents there. Uh, but I think he gets this one done. I don't know that. It, at a two to one favorite, I would really be too invested in it. Like you said, maybe a parlay piece, but it's hard to it's hard to trust him. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe I would look to see uh, Dawkins by sub in this one, just because he has really uh, great BJJ. And if this fight hits the mat, you know, Andrews is probably going to look to to clinch a little bit, and I think Dawkins could find something. So that's probably the avenue I would take. I'm going to take Dawkins for my pick. Uh, but at two to one, I wouldn't take it straight up. Yeah. Um, over under wise. I don't know. That, yeah, that one's tough on this fight. It really is. I mean, you got Eric Anders who, who goes to the decision quite a bit unless he's losing yeah. I and mean, he, he's been submitted before. Um, 
that one is tough because you know if Eric Anders had it his way, he's just going to grind out a, a, right. a decision win. But right. Dawkins does have some tools to finish guys. Just hasn't done it at a super super high level yet. Yeah, well, if you're Eric Anders, uh, you can't bet on your fight anymore. <laughs> yeah. or you can't lose your purse. <laughs> so uh, saving yourself there. But uh, move on to the welterweight banger here, Nico Price and Philip Rowe. Nico Price coming off the win to Alex Oliveira over a month ago or over a year ago. Yeah. And uh, Phil Rowe, the win over Jason Witt nine months ago. This one sitting pretty close in the betting odds. Uh, Phil Rowe is going to be one of, bigger, one of the bigger welterweights as well, six foot three, 80 and a half inch reach. Nico Price going to be a little undersized compared to him. Uh, this one's going to be violence. I know you put out on your, your TikTok that you were taking the under in this one. I think that's definitely a solid play. Uh, but as far as who you would pick, who are you thinking? It's super tough. I mean, both guys have the ability to end it at any time. I'm um, looking right now at Nico Price. What is he, 15 and 5? And there's two, he's got two losses here, you know, somewhat recently in the last couple of years, the Vicente Luque and Michelle Pajeda which, you know, both those guys are finishers as well. And one was an eye injury. But I don't know. I like Philip Rowe. I think he's super talented, 9-3 and three right now, so he doesn't have as much experience, but he's definitely not lacking experience. And he's super game. I know he's got the win over Jason Witt and Orion Kosey, so he hasn't quite got into that, you know, higher level or higher echelon in the UFC quite yet. So I think there's going to be a lot of answered questions around both of these guys. But – Right now, I'm leaning the underdog, Philip Rowe, at plus 120, probably just more because of the price. Um, it's a tough one to pick, but for me, this one's dog or pass, and it's got to be Philip Rowe, and I'm definitely taking the under because I do think there's going to be a lot of violence in this one. Yeah, uh, I know we've agreed on a lot of these picks, and I hate to like always agree, but I got to lean the same way in this one. Uh, yeah. As the kind of dog or pass as well, I wanted to bet on Nico Price, uh, just considering he's had the better competition that he's faced. Uh, but Phil Rowe, I think he has the advantage on the mat. He's bigger on the feet. Nico Price kind of just fights wild. I right. would maybe, I don't know, maybe look to see how the first round goes. You know, if if Nico Price is having success on the feet, uh, but this one's just violence. I think the under two and a half is definitely. Uh, the play, yeah, play to take there. Uh, but as far as who I'm going to pick for my pick, I'm going to take Philip Rowe, the dog. And if I was going to bet it, I would take I would take Rowe uh, by submission. I don't see a price out there for that. Uh, but he's he's done a lot of grappling uh, tournaments. If you look on Tapology, he's had four of them in the past uh, year or the past year and a half. Uh, he's lost all of them, but <laughs> yeah, he's working on it. He's, he's working, working on, on it. <laughs> uh, he, one of them is to Gordon Ryan. So I mean, yeah, if you're gonna fight someone and lose to him, Gordon Ryan's not, or grapple with someone and lose to them, Gordon Ryan's not the worst person to lose to. Uh, but he's working on it, and I yeah. think that could could look to or could show itself in its in the fight Saturday. So yeah, and he's always got the ability to put you out on the feet too. I mean, there's two. Recent wins, Jason Witt or Ryan Kosey, he did win by TKO. So all around, I, I just think he's got more ways to win. It will be a close fight, and it will it should be a lot of fun at least. Um, but if Philip Rose a you know an underdog, I'm, I'm going to take him here. Agreed. Move on to a women's strawweight fight here. Angela over Kill Hill and Emily Ducati. Ah, uh, this one. Angela Hill, man. <laughs> Angela Hill spoiled my my breakfast in the the last fight. Uh, I had Lupita Godinez beating her at I think UFC San Diego, and she was like a minus three hundred favorite. And mm -hmm. you know I'm I'm feeling good about Lupita Godinez, and uh, she's coming off a big win where she dominated. And I'm like Angela Hill, damn near a five hundred fighter uh, in the UFC, and I'm feeling good about it, and right before the fight happens, they show on the screen, Angela Hill, 
is 0 and 8 as an underdog <laughs> in the UFC. So I'm like, all right, this is perfect. Like she's never won as an underdog. Uh, she's an underdog in this one, but she went out there and uh, she got the win uh, over my Lupita Godinez, and that has completely scarred me from ever betting on Lupita Godinez ever again in the future. And Angela Hill, she's 37, damn near 38 years old, but she's still game. And uh, even though she is 14 and 12, a lot of her fights have been just super close. So right. it's hard to, to bet against her. Uh, but I mean, she's one and eight as an underdog. Is Can she move to two and eight in this one? I mean, it's, it's a close one here. So she's only plus 110. Emily Ducote, not really. I mean, in her last fight, she looked pretty good. She, it was her, her debut in the UFC. I just watched it the other day again. She's kind of like a flat-footed, hands-high, um, kind of a counter striker, not really a, a you know light on her feet, kind of an Angela Hill type. So these are right. different styles. Uh, but women's MMA, I'd probably lean the dog if it's this close. So I'm going to take Angela Hill. Because yeah. He needs to redeem me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think this fight is, you know, is more suited for Angela Hill than Lupita Godinez even. And uh, Duc Ducati, like you said, looked pretty good in her debut fighting Jessica Panay. Her leg kicks looked really, really good in that fight. I mean, she almost finished her by leg kicks. Against Angela Hill, Angela Hill is skilled enough on the feet. I don't think you're going to be able to just walk right in front of her and kick her legs out from under her. Angela Hill is a good counter puncher. Um, she is light on her feet. And I think Ducati is going to, this is kind of the next level for her already in her second fight. I just, I don't know. I like Angela Hill's experience. I like the way she moves on the feet. I think she's the perfect fighter to give Emily Ducati a lot of problems and uh, officially welcome to the UFC. Here's a pretty tough fight in front of you. So if Angela Hill's a slight underdog in this fight, that's who I'm going to lean with. I, she does have a lot of losses, but I mean, look at who she's fighting. Tisha Torres, Amanda Lemos. Uh, Verna Jan John Aroba. I mean, so she's not fighting bums by any means and then beat Lupita Godinez. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't think Angela Hill, um, is necessarily out of the realm or out of her league in this fight at all. I think it's going to be a close one as the odds indicate and plus plus one ten. um, Angela Hill sounds pretty good in this fight to me against a girl who doesn't have a ton of experience in the UFC. Yeah. Uh, usually like to fade, uh, like, a person making their debut and yeah. in your debut, it was Jessica Penne who was kind of like the bottom of the barrel for the strawweight division at this point. Uh, not too bad of a, a spot to fade her against a very experienced Angela Hill. Right. One and eight as an underdog right now. Let's make it two and eight, Angela Hill. How about that? <laughs> Move on to Clay Guida and Scott Holtzman. I think this one is, is going to be a banger as well. I mean, we all know Clay Guida is always game for a fight. And Scott Holtzman, looking back at who he's fought, let's just take a look at this. I mean, his, crazy. Losses, his losses are to Mateusz Gamrat, Benil Daryush, Nick Lentz, Josh Emmett, who's fighting for a title, and Drew Dober. So his losses are to some really good competition. Yeah, uh, Both fighters are fairly old at this point, uh, 40 years or almost 41 for Clay Guida and 39 years old for Scott Holtzman. What do you think of this one? I was on Clay Guida in, the la in his last fight, and he got beat um, right away, I believe. Yeah, round one by Claudio yeah. Puelas. And knee bar. By knee bar, yeah. The problem with Clay Guida is he's got that, like, 2005 UFC style. <laughs> like, I'm going to come in there, run across the cage at you, and just make this a brawl. And guys now are so technical and so good that that just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, but he is, I mean, he is a pretty powerful guy. Um, he is wild, but in, and with guys like that come the chance that he finds some kind of crazy knockout. Um, but I don't know. I, he is, a, is pretty damn old too. And he's getting up there. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of the last times we see Clay Guida in mm. the UFC. Scott Holtzman has fought some damn good fighters like you listed off. I mean, there's no shame at this point in his career losing to Mateusz Gamrot. Benil Dariush, who is on the door of fighting for a title, and then guys like Josh Emmett, who is fighting for a title, and Drew Dober, who's a tough out for everybody in the UFC. Um, I don't know. Everything's screaming Scott Holtzman here. 
Clay Guida, I just don't know if his style suits today's age in UFC anymore. Um, see, I got to fade Clay Guida in this one. I hate doing it because he's so much fun to watch in there, all the way from the walkout to the when he gets inside the ring or the octagon, excuse me. Um, but minus 150, Scott Holtzman, I think there's some value in that one. Yeah, I, when I saw that number, I initially thought Scott Holtzman at minus 150 is not bad at all considering the only people that he's lost to. Uh, but at, then I remembered he's 39 and it's like, he's coming off two uh, knockout losses that weren't too pretty. Yeah. Uh, so as far as a side, I don't think I'm going to have any bet on a side, but I think there's some decent value on, on uh, the under two and a half in this one. I, I got it. I'm looking at it right now. It's plus 170. That seems like, some pretty solid plus money considering Holtzman's coming off two bad KO losses. Um, and Clay Guida has, has, hasn't gone to decision uh, that often in his past few fights. Uh, loss in the first round to Poyas, uh, win in the second round over Leo San- Santos, and then uh, the fight before that he went to decision over Mar- with Mark Madsen. But we all know how Mark Madsen fights. So. Right. I think the under two and a half has, has a, a good price there at plus 170. Not, I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, uh, but I'll definitely keep an eye on it. Maybe see how how they look at weigh-ins or anything. And yeah. Scott, Scott Holtzman is a big dude yeah. uh, at 155. He's only 5'9", but he's thick. He's a thick 155 or so. See how that weight cut looks or just see how he looks in general because he hasn't fought in a year and seven months. Uh, so that's kind of my lean in this one. I'll take Scott Holt- Holtzman for my pick. I don't have a side, but the under two and a half is something I'm keeping my eyes on in that one. Move on to Mar- or, yeah, March Casey and Michael Johnson. This one, uh, I think I know how this one's going to go, uh, but I'm interested to see how, how you think it's going to go. Mark Casey coming off two wins and uh, Michael Johnson, the split decision loss to Jamie Malarkey. That was a close fight and he was a pretty hefty underdog in that one. Yeah. Uh, but what are you thinking of this one? Yeah, it's tough because Johnson, you look at his record, he's got a lot of losses recently. Um, that last fight, I wouldn't have been mad if they gave him the win in that one. Both guys had clipped each other. Both guys had knocked each other's down. It was a damn good fight. Uh, but to Casey right now, I don't know. I just feel like he's going to be, the more superior fighter and he's got that youth factor on his side compared to Michael Johnson. I believe let's see. I want to see how old Michael Johnson is. 36 years and 36 into Casey's 29. So yeah, yeah, I mean, Michael Johnson's been in a lot of wars. He's taken a lot of damage and he's going to be in there with Mark the Casey who can grapple. He can strike. He kind of does it all. Um, Michael Johnson could Get a knockout. He does clip a lot of guys. I mean, he's one of the only guys, if not the only guy, to ever have Habib in a little bit of trouble. I know it was years and years ago. Um, but I don't know. Everything's pointing towards Mark DeCasey here. And I do I do like him as a parlay piece here. Yeah, same here. Uh, Michael Johnson, 20 and 18. But he has fought the best of the best. And he has right. hung with the best of the best. Uh, but at 36 years old, that's a lot of miles on there. Um, probably more miles than that 36 would tell. He's been in some wars. Mark Jacasey kind of entering his prime here, he coming off two wins back-to-back that were extremely boring. But, I mean, he just dominates people that way. You know, if he if he pushes his wrestling and the takedowns. Uh, I saw on your TikTok you did the top five greatest athletes in the UFC. I think now that I'm I'm looking at it right now, Mark Casey would be on my list. He could be up there for sure. He's, he's I think he's one of the best in the in the UFC. One of the best I've seen. Uh, super explosive. I mean, on right. his takedowns, it's like if he gets anywhere near you, he's going to be shooting his hips through and getting you to the ground. And he's got great top control. Doesn't really work for any like finishes on the top, which is a little, you know, frustrating to watch at times. But yeah. It's very effective, and uh, the two people that he's beaten 
Uh, Demir Hadzovic, who's got power in his hands, but not great on the ground. Orshev, same same deal there. Uh, just controlled them on the ground and got the win. I think he's a great parlay piece in this one. Uh, I think he's got a lot more to fight for in this. Michael Johnson, he's always going to be game, but you know, at, at his age and where his career is at, it's like, is he really going to care that that much if he wins or loses? Exactly. Could clip Mark Casey. You never know, but I would bet he doesn't. And right. um, Mark Casey is probably one of my, my bigger uh, or my best picks this week as far as my confidence level. So Yeah, and Jukasey, he you know, he's a guy that might get booed by the crowd for being boring, but he doesn't care. He's going to stick to his game plan. He's going to do whatever he, he has to do to get the win. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if we see Mark Casey get 11, 12 minutes control time, get the crowd booing him, and he's going to walk away with a 30-27 decision win, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh if he does that and I got money on him, I'm fine with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, don't I look at look at it, but <laughs> if I don't have money on him, I'm like, he's just not even doing anything. <laughs> One of those fights that like you pray it's boring just to get yeah. to the finish line and cash your ticket. <laughs> exactly. Like just don't even try to go for anything, just lay on him. But yeah. This uh the the heaviest favorite on the card, Jonathan Pierce and Darren Elkins. This one I think could be a decent fight here. Jonathan Pierce, four straight uh, wins for him. He's lost to Joe Lozon. I believe that was his uh, debut. But yeah. since then, he's looked uh, pretty much unstoppable. A lot of improvements there. Darren Elkins, 38 years old. Um, definitely towards the back end of his career. Uh, but still a live dog here. What are you thinking on this one? Yeah, I actually like Jonathan Pierce a lot as a fighter, as an up-and-comer. Um, he's super game, but he's going to be fighting Darren Elkins, who's just as game. Elkins has been in some wars. He's always leaving that cage bloody. Uh, he's not scared to take some shots. I just think at his age, fighting the up-and-comer Pierce, who you know is looking to make a title run. I mean, that kid is focused. He's wanting to move up the ranks, and this is a perfect stepping stone. Get in there and get a win over Darren Elkins. I think the play that I really, really like in this fight is the under two and a half rounds, only minus 135 right now. I think there's some value there because Pierce is going to hit you. Um, Darren Elkins has a lot of miles on him. He's taken a lot of damage. And, uh, you know, he, his last loss was to Cub Swanson, which he lost by uh, it was a wheel kick and then ground and pound. So I, I just think a guy like Jonathan Pierce has the ability to knock out Darren Elkins at this stage in Darren Elkins' career. And I'm definitely leaving Jonathan Pierce by KO. When those odds come out, I'm going to hammer it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, I, we're going to agree <laughs> again. But yep. I think Jonathan Pierce gets it done inside the distance, considering the, the amount of miles that Elkins has on his resume and uh, just generally what does he have to fight for at this point. Right. Uh, Jonathan Pierce, besides his loss to Joe Lozon, he's got three finishes out of four fights. His only – fight he didn't get a finish was Christian Rodriguez who we've talked about we think very highly of um as a young fighter there so I think he gets it done with inside the dis inside the distance and the under two and a half is definitely a solid play uh, I would get on that uh, as soon as you can right in, in my opinion because I think that that'll get bought down yeah that line's gonna that line will move I have a feeling come Thursday, Friday, people start putting their bets in for the UFC this weekend, and that line is definitely not going to be as good as it is right now for you. Yeah, I mean, at the biggest favorite on the card, you got to expect him to get a finish, you know? Right. It's like, if you're that big of a favorite, you should be getting a finish. And uh, when the line is is that, you know, minus 135 for under two and a half, I think you got to take that. Right. So, Agree. All right. Tracy Cortez and Amanda Hebus Cortez, 10 and one coming in as a slight underdog in this one. I believe she's been favored in almost all of her fights. Um, Amanda Hebus coming off the loss to Kaylin Shkagan, which was a split decision loss and a very close fight in that one. Both fighters similar in age. Uh, Cortez is going to have a couple inches in height. Um, I think this is kind of, uh, kind of dog or pass uh, in this one, just considering Cortez has been 
looking really good as of late. She's been working with uh, Cejudo at Fight Ready, and she's a very good good wrestler. Hibas is definitely – She's good. I, I would have expected Cortez to be the favorite in this one, uh, just considering what she's done recently and, and Hebas coming off of a loss. Um, I would have expected Cortez to be the favorite, so I think her at the, the slight plus money is the play here. Uh, I have a unit on her at like plus 115. I got a, like a month ago, uh, but that's my play in this one. I think she'll be able to, to get the takedowns and uh, sit in the guard and and do what she does. Uh, probably Cortez by decision is probably how it'll go, but I wouldn't be surprised if Hebus wins. But just at these odds, I think uh, Cortez sh- should be the favorite. So what do you think? I mean, Cortez has been dating Brian Ortega for a while now. You know that jiu-jitsu is going to be sharpened up and ready to go. Um, yeah, no, I- I'm the same way. And minus 105, I was a little shocked to hear that she is the slight underdog in this fight. I mean, uh, Amanda Hibas is one and two in her last three fights. Her two losses are to Chikavian and Madrina Rodriguez. So, I mean, no, you know, those aren't terrible losses by any means. But I do like Tracy Cortez. I'm glad we're seeing her back in the octagon. I hope she gets at more active, gets some more experience under her belt. And if she can beat Amanda Hibas, man, that's a big win for her and her career going forward. And uh, I'm not highly confident she gets it done. I do think that she will be able to, wherever this fight goes, hang with Amanda Hibas. And I do think she'll be slightly sharper if she can get it down to the ground. Um, like you said, decision. I want to see the odds on her at decision because I think that's definitely a good play. And that's probably what I'm going to be taking in this fight. Yeah. Um, not a lot more to say on that one, uh, but I'll take Cortez for my pick. And I think she should be favored. So the plus money is the play in that one. I'm sure – I think the over-under is probably just like minus 300-something for the over two and a half. So, not really even worth it there. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, but move on to Natan Levy and Guinaro Valdez. I believe that's how you say it. Uh, Natan Levy coming off the win to Mike Breed in there. Uh, his only loss is to Rafa Garcia. Valdez coming off the loss to Matt Favola in his UFC debut. He's sitting at the the dog here. Uh, this one is – I can't really get a good read in this one. I mean, Natan Levy looked pretty decent in his last one out. But, you know, I wouldn't buy too much into him. What are you thinking on this one, though? Cause, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, Valdez losing to Favola who, you know, is tough and can and, – and can fight with the best of them in that division. So that's a tough out there. But Natan Levy should win this fight, in my opinion. But minus 180, I just don't even think that's enough value for me to pull the trigger on his money line here. I just don't think either of these guys are as experienced um, as I would like them to be before I do place a unit or two on them. Yeah. I think both guys have a ways to go um, before we actually know a lot about them as far as their styles as far as how they're able to beat guys, what their best tools and a- attributes are. And I don't think we're there that yet with either guy, honestly. Um, based off past fights, I mean, I think we'll – I think the line – I think it's going to be a closer fight than the line indicates, minus 180 and, minus, and plus 155. Um, it's hard to get a read off that line because we just haven't seen a lot of either guy yet. Um, so, yeah, like you said, it's a tough one. I'll be interested to see – Let's see. I, I might have it here. Under two and a half, minus 155. I actually might lean the over here. Um, I know that uh, Valdez, you know, got finished in his last fight and Levy went to decision. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to be surprised if Levy goes in there, tries to grapple, and this is just kind of one of those fights that we see on the ground. Neither guy really looking for too many submissions. A little bit of ground and pound here. Um, so, yeah, you know, if I'm playing anything, I might look at that over, but I'm not going to have a big play anywhere on this fight. Yeah, I'll take Natan Levy for my pick. I uh, probably will stay away from that one unless uh, I look further into it as the week goes on and see something that I like. But as of now, no bet for me. Right. Because, I mean, you look at, like, Valdez's past fights outside of the UFC. He's fighting guys that are 1-2, and 5-0, and 0-2, oh, 1-0, and 1-0. Oh, and oh, oh. I mean, right. I mean, he had a couple where he fought guys with good records. But other than that, you know, he doesn't have – a ton of high level experience. And we definitely saw that 
with Matt Favola in that fight. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to, you know, really get a read going into this fight because, hell, he could go in there and look like a world beater. We just haven't seen enough of him to know yet, in my opinion. Yeah. Speaking of hard to get a read, this one, <laughs> yeah. can't really get much of a read on this one either. I mean, Francis Marshall is undefeated, 23 years old, uh, coming off his win on Dana White Contender Series this past season. Marcelo Rojo uh, lost to Kyler Phillips in his last one out and a loss to Charles Jordan in his debut. So a couple of uh, tough fights for Mar Marcelo Rojo, but 34 years old for him. I really want to fade Francis Marshall considering it's his debut on a, you know, on a, in the UFC Orlando. So a full crowd, uh, right. who knows? I don't know. I mean, it's an Orlando card. So, I don't think there will be too many people in the arena at that point. I will be. Yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> diehards will be. But, yeah. You know, you see the, the the cards in like Las Vegas, and there's like nobody yeah. there until the main main card. Right. Uh, but like you see the other, like when I went to UFC Columbus, there was a decent amount of people in there right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but there would be there would be like nobody there at a card in Vegas. So I'm interested right. to see how that is for Orlando. Um, if they're, if it's going to be packed at the start or not, but Francis Marshall, I always like to fade people coming off the Dana White contender series and Marcelo Rojo's two fights of the UFC have been kind of tough. So right. I kind of want to cut him some slack here and, and take the underdog uh, Marcelo Rojo. He's at plus one fifty right now. I'm not, I'm not too sold on it. Uh, I'll, I'll take, I don't know who I'm going to take yet for my pick, but I'm going to keep an eye on this this one moving forward and see if if I get there from a betting standpoint to to fade Francis Marshall and go with Marcelo Rojo. Uh, the only thing that's really keeping me away from that is that Marcelo Rojo kind of got dominated on the ground with Kyler Phillips, mm -hmm. and Francis Marshall has a good ground game. It's just like the the experience. Factor for me, Rojo's had 24 professional fights. He's 34 years old. Francis Marshall, six fights, 23 years old, going to be stepping into uh, a full arena, and who knows what he's going to look like. But what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely tough, especially a guy coming in um, for his UFC debut. But in this case, here's, here's kind of what I'm looking at here. You look at Rojo and his losses are by armbar, uh, or triangle armbar to Kyler Phillips, you know, Charles Jordan by TKO, John Castaneda by triangle choke. Uh, what was his last lo or loss before that? It was Mara Quinn lost by guillotine. So he loses a lot by submission, which is exactly how Francis Marshall wins his lo a lot of his fights. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a style thing for me here. I'm not taking anybody on the money line. I'm going to sprinkle on a prop when it comes out. I think I am going to take Francis Marshall by submission. I mean, just from the track record of Rojo being submitted quite a few times in his losses and then Francis Marshall getting quite a few submissions early on in his career. Um, but the one thing that would hold me back on, the, on taking um, Francis Marshall on the money line here is the experience factor of Rojo. He's been in there a hell of a lot more than Marshall, and it is Marshall's debut. So it is a tricky one. It's one of those that I'm just going to have fun with a prop, and I'm definitely going to take Francis Marshall by submission for my prop when those lines come out. Yeah, I, if it's juicy enough, I'll definitely sprinkle something on that because if he does win, uh, I do see him getting a finish. And yeah. I th the only way I think Marcelo Rojo wins this is if he's just able to keep him off of him. And, you know, Francis Marshall, it's like kind of starts to shoot when he when he can't. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's hard right. to like, no, 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 I get what you're saying. It's like panic shoot. And then yeah. he, when he's not getting the takedowns, he just starts to panic shoot and he, it starts to look bad. And Marcelo Rojo gets like more confidence. But yeah, I'll, t I'll take Rojo for my pick, whatever. I'll throw it on there as a dog. But uh, if I'm going to bet it, it's either going to be Rojo uh, by decision or Marshall uh, by submission. So we'll move on to another 23 year old, Yasmin Yaragui. Uh, 23 years and nine months, so damn near the same age. Undefeated, coming off the win to 
Yasmin Dusin, though. And uh, she's going to be fighting Estelle Nunez. She's a pretty big favorite in this one. Nunez, two straight losses to Carnelosi and Sam Hughes. 30 years old for her. Uh, Uruguay is one of my uh, bigger plays this week as far as confidence level. Definitely. I think she's has, uh, you know, title possibility uh, in the future. It's only 23 years old, so she's only getting better. She has a, a good ground game as well. Uh, I think her Instagram name is like Yasmin Jiu-Jitsu or something like that. So <laughs> yeah. definitely – capable there but on the feet in her last fight she looked just extremely sharp in her debut uh Nunez nothing too special uh in my opinion but I mean she's like she's an, an average uh UFC strawweight in, in yeah. my opinion and I think Yasmin is is above average and has you know title in her future uh so I think Yasmin gets this one done pretty easily uh, and I think her and Casey parlayed together. I got on mine at minus 137. I think that's a solid parlay, a solid two leg parlay. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take Yasmin in this one. Yo, I'm the same way. She's one of my most confident picks because in her UFC debut, dude, she, this chick is a savage. I mean, she goes in there. She will stand and bang with you. She's got a good ground game, and she just looks sharp overall. Estela Nunez coming off two losses, like you said. I just you look at these two side by side fight, and Yasmin is the superior athlete. And at this level in the UFC, I think Yasmin. This is just a little stepping stone for her. She's going to go straight to the top if she keeps um, on the path she's on. I think she's one who has a desire to be the UFC champ one day as well. I think she sees a path to that title, and I think um, you know. Estela Nunez, Sam Hughes, Ariana Carnelosi. I think right now Yasmin is better than both of those fighters as it sits right now. So I think she has her hands full. I just don't see how Estela Nunez gets the fight done here at all. So yeah, Yasmin is going to be the play for me. Definitely a parlay piece to kick the night off. I think it's an easy first leg cash. Um, yeah. I'm definitely going to throw her into one as the week goes on for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely keep my eyes open for a Yasmin by KO in this one as well, or at least a Yasmin inside the distance. I think she's that good on the feet and all around that she could get this done inside the distance. But uh, so we got what 15 fights on this, this card. So 15 fights from the top down. I got Kevin Holland, Rafael dos Anjos, N Mateos, Nicolau, Tai Tuivasa, uh, Roman Delite. Kyle Dawkins, Phil Rowe, Angela Hill, Scott Holtzman, Mark Jacasey, Jonathan Pierce, Tracy Cortez, Natan Levy, Marcelo Rojo, and Yasmin Yaregui. I'm going to be super similar. I know we agreed on a lot of these fights. Yeah. Kevin Holland, RDA, Mateus Nicolau, Ty Tui Voss. I'd love for that underdog to cash. I'm going to go Roman Delize as well for the underdog. Uh, Kyle Dawkins gets it done. Philip Rowe, Angela Hill, Scott Holtzman, Mark DeCasey, uh, Jonathan Pierce, Tracy Cortez, Natan Levy, Francis Marshall, and uh, the last one, Yasmin Uruguay. Getting it done. Nice. I think was the only one that we disagreed on the Marshall Rojo one. I, I think it might have been. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, it's just one of those cards, man. It just doesn't. It is. It doesn't feel like the underdogs have much room to win these fights. Right. I, I know the, there are some lines that are close, but it just it, it just feels like one of those cards. I don't know. I could go up there and it could be an underdog night, and I'm going to get absolutely crushed. But that's what <laughs> props are for. We're going to hit some good yeah. props this weekend. Yeah. Right now for my bets, I got Holland money line, uh, Cortez money line, Tuivasa money line. The under two and a half in the match now and Mateusz Nicolau fight and the parlay with Yasmin Yargui and Mark Jacasey. You got anything live right now? I might have to tell your Mark Jacasey and, and Yasmin one. Um, but as we were doing this, I did take Kevin Holland by submission because it came out at plus 600. That's the only fight so far I've seen the props out just for that main event. Um, other than that, I really do <sighs> – I want to say I really like Roman Delize, but I am going to sprinkle on that one for sure, probably after we get off here in that underdog spot. Other than that, the only ones that I have locked in so far is Philip Rowe. He's an underdog. 
I do like Angela Hill. That's another one I'm going to probably hit right after this before the lines get a little bit further apart. But other than that, I haven't pulled the trigger on much yet because I'm waiting to see as the week goes on if I can get some better odds on some of these guys because right now there's some heavier favorites that I think the line should be closer, and I think we'll see closer odds as the week goes on. All right, well, you are going to be in, t- in attendance for in. For we'll be this- there. You'll be there. Uh, what which fight are you looking most forward to? I'm, okay, let's see. On the prelims, oh man, I really uh, the Nico Price and Philip Rowe is is probably the one I can't wait for the most on the prelims. But um, Tracy Cortez, Amanda Hivas, I don't know. I want to see if Ortega's in the in the corner. It'd be kind of cool. <laughs> I think be that'll cool. be a fun one. Um, and then even you know Darren Elkins, Jonathan Pierce, I think is going to be a fun one too. Pure violence. And then on the main card, Ty Tuivasa, Sergey Pavlovich. Um, you know, Matt Schnell and, and Mateusz Nikolaou, not a lot of star power name there, but that's another fight that just screams violence. And mm-hmm. uh, obviously, Wonder Boy and Kevin Holland. But, dude, every single fight on here I think could be phenomenal. I think we're in for a super good 15-fight card with a lot of different possibilities, uh, a lot of violence in the, some of these fights, and uh, some pretty high-level skilled fighters. Yeah, 15 fights. That is a stacked card. Let's hope and pray that every fighter did not have a Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. And they will make weight come Friday. Yeah. But uh, at the double leg on all the social medias, TikTok and Instagram, if you're watching here on YouTube, please leave a subscription, a like, and a comment down below. You can find me on all the medias, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff at HeyJiPicks. Where can they find you? TikTok, the parlay, Instagram, the parlay, underscore media, and YouTube, the parlay, MMA. All righty. Until then, in our next video, this is the double leg. We are out.